And yeah, Terry, you're good to go. Camera, we are. Yeah, should we? Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jerry Peterson with Home Energy Services. And uh, we're going to talk about ERI or the Energy Rating Index today. Um, this is a uh, something that's been around for a while, but we brought it into the code as a compliance option in the um, 2015 Energy Code. Um, just a little bit about me. I previously was the Energy Program Manager for the state of Idaho. I did that for almost 10 years. And I started that job um, shortly after the uh, American Reinvestment and Recovery Act was signed into effect. And one of the stipulations of taking the ARA funds was that uh, every state agreed to adopt the 2009 Energy Code within three years and be able to prove that they were in 90% compliance. Um, that was a tough tax, uh, mostly because Idaho is a blend of state and local jurisdictions. And so tracking compliance um, proved to be a challenge. And uh, to that mean or to that end, I developed um, a software program that was um, very user friendly, highly automated. Um, and made it available for free to anybody that, that used it to kind of measure the most um, important parts of the code. And so I, that was that software program I kind of built from scratch. And that was part of my introduction um, to everybody in the energy field. Um, and then also since then, I've been providing energy code related training around the state. I have a, a bunch of different classes that I do. So sorry for the long introduction, but um, big thing today as with any of our classes is I'm really here to answer questions. Uh, we, we do want people to engage. And so um, we'll be we're trying to watch the uh, chat um, or you can unmute yourself. But if you have any questions, please, Let's get those addressed when um, as much as we can. I don't want anybody going home uh, misinformed. And so, um, you know, want to be able to cover that. Also, at the very end is my contact information, my cell phone, my email address. And so if you have a question that, you know, you, you don't want to ask during the class, please follow up with me. Send me a text or an email, and I will try to uh, respond to that. I can make copies of the presentation available, um, but the you know the curriculum does change, and as I find new information, it, it does change. So um, I'm I'm happy to share my courses. Just know that they do um, or they may be um, updated. So so our course objectives for today is the uh, introduce the ERI as a compliance option. We're gonna analyze some of the variables that go into it, um, discuss the benefits to builders and present ideas for builders to use, you know, to help them market um, the ERI approach to current customers or potential customers. And so this is um, pretty common, you know, for the builders when we are asking them to do something different or maybe a little more um, you know, then the minimum, you know, they, they want to know is what the potential is for you know, getting that, that money back. So we try to make a case for them too, so that uh, they're encouraged to use it. So right now, the way our energy code works, we have four compliance pathways. The prescriptive is just following down the table. It says, you know, this is how much you have to put in the walls, ceilings. This is what your windows have to look like. Um, everything that, you know, is, is a standalone item um, will be on that pre prescriptive table. And I would say that the majority of houses still use either prescriptive or the UA alternative. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, 
the, the program that we use for that is ResCheck. Uh, it, it also is a very prescriptive um, format, but it allows you to use total wall assemblies. Um, so it's, it's, less, it's less measurements, a um, little more defined, and it does allow um, some trade off, um, you know, where you can trade one thing and make it up with something else. It doesn't give you a lot of room. It doesn't allow for appliances, um, you know, it's pretty much restricted to the building envelope. Um, ResCheck is very uh, common, it's easy to use, and a high percentage of the prescriptive, um, or what we refer to as prescriptive, are actually res checks. Um, the building jurisdictions like them, it tends to be one page, maybe two. And, uh, you know, Brad says this is what they're going to do. And then when they inspect it, they, ju they just check the items against the list. So uh, res check is a very popular compliance pathway. The next one is performance or simulated performance. Um, these are programs like, um, help me out here, um, Energy Star would be one, um, Energy Plus, Beop Energy Plus, would be another one. Um, and so this is a, another pathway where you, you use a, a, an approved program or a program that you're hoping is approved. And you're saying, you know, my house uses the same amount of energy as it would um, if we were using the prescriptive or the UA alternative. And so we call that the performance pathway. This is not, it's not very common, um, but it can be used and it probably is used more in, uh, you know, custom houses or one-off houses. Um, you know, where they want to do something above and beyond, but they don't want to do a full-blown HERS rating, or they just want to use a different type of uh, performance pathway. What we're going to talk about today is the energy rating index um, specifically um, and what's involved in that program. And so for the, those that uh, are following the code part of the course, there's not a ton of code in here, but the ERI is found in the energy code in section R406. And what it does, um, try to, to not complicate this anymore, I have to, is we use a score. And so we, you know, in order to have a, a functional score, we have to have some kind of a baseline. And so what they've, what ResNet or ERI is based on is a 2006 energy uh, code home using the prescriptive method would have a score of 100. And then each number above or below that would indicate a lower number would be um, an improvement and a higher number would be, you know, using more energy. So the, the purpose of using this baseline is we don't want a number that floats around. We need something that, that is solid that we can measure everything against. And there are discussions and debates out there about what number we should be using, but just know that um, for code purposes, this is how it's set up, that we use 100 of the 2006. I'll show you some an actual rating later and how those numbers can move up and down um, to give you an idea of kind of the range um, that we're talking about. The other part of using the ERI, there are some mandatory provisions in there that said no matter what the number is, you still have to meet the hot water pipe insulation requirements and the prescriptive envelope requirements from the 2009 IECC. Um, and again, it, you know, there's lots of discussion as to why, but the prescriptive envelope requirements really haven't changed much from 2009 um, through the 12, through the 15, through the 18. 
And so they say, well, you know, we don't want to build a glass house that is totally supported by PV and doesn't meet any of the prescriptive requirements because even though the house would have a really good score, nobody would want to live there. And so we need some kind of a base level of envelope um, just to keep the house livable and comfortable. So this is kind of their, their reasoning for doing that. Are you watching? It's just a, no, it's just a calendar notification if you can see So the other part of the ERI is it, is it has to be, um, I sh should cover this before I switch to the next slide. It does require third-party verification. And so um, you can use ERI for your plan review purposes, um, but there's always a third-party rater involved. And so they are, are part of the initial plan review before it's submitted. Um, they typically will do um, a pre-cover inspection um, to make sure their air sealing is in place, and then they will do um, the final testing, which includes the blower door test and the duct blaster test. And so they are they are saying in their initial um, plan, you know, what those targets would be, and then they verify them at the end of whether or not they met what their intentions were. So the, these are, the verification is done through a HERS Raider. Uh, HERS has been around for a long time and um, I'm sure most of you have heard the term HERS or HERS rated. It's the home energy rating score is what HERS stands for. And so these are um, private companies that have went through a pretty extensive training program um, they are required to maintain uh, continuing education, and there is a, a uh, requirement to do X amount of homes a year to maintain their um, their rating, their rater standard. And so, um, I I was a HERS rater um, for a number of years when I worked for the state, but because of the, the way that um, the language is written, I could not perform uh, ratings on homes um, because it was a conflict of interest with my job. And so I used most of that time um, to kind of verify plans and look at plans and optimize plans. And that's how I used it. Um, hers wasn't happy with that. And I ended up losing my Raider certification because I wasn't doing the, the home part of it. Um, and they had talked about developing a different certification for plan reviewers. And then I, I don't know where that discussion went, but as of today, I don't think there's anything um, available for people that are just um, doing the uh, calculations or verification for compliance. There, so the the HERS, the HERS method itself is based on an ANSI ResNet standard 301. This slide has the date on it, but the um, newer code books don't reference a date. They just say that it's based on the ANSI standard 301. This is a, a standalone uh, publication. And in that publication, it, it lays out the protocols for testing. And so if you're curious as to how you're supposed to measure things and how all of that works, all of that is in this um, ANSI standard. So it's, it's available as a separate. It's not real thick, um, but I, I don't think they date it anymore. I think they, you know, because they, it, will, it is not on in the same schedule as the code. And so it's like this one, you know, looking at this one going, why are you using such an old standard? Well, it's because protocols don't, don't really change. Um, so I, I think they just got rid of the date. Um, 
This slide, I've been doing this program for a couple of years, so I don't know what their current um, rate is, but at the time I initially put this together, they had done over uh, one and a half million homes in the United States. They do employ qualified raters. I talked about that a little bit, and there is a, um, a quality assurance review. There, there is a certain number of homes that are subject to review. And so as you're going through your raters, you have to submit, um, it's their call, then they will ask for a specific number of um, homes and they wanna see all the paperwork and testing and everything to ensure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So there is a, a, another layer of approval um, to make sure the raters are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is a certificate. Um, I wish I could blow this up a little bit. Um, but this is kind of what gets printed out. Um, the modeling is done through a, a software program called REMRATE. Um, if you are a rater, then that's where you get your, your certificates and numbers from. They do make a, the same software, and it is exactly the same software, um, called REM Design, and that anybody can use, but you can't print out certificates. Um, and so I will, I'll talk some more about REM Design. It's a great program. And even though I'm not a rater, I still use the REM Design software because it tells me what I need to know, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. I don't know if this it does. This has a, um, let me step away from the camera here for a second. So right here is your number. This particular home is a 43. This would be a nice, comfortable, low cost home. And it talks about it's 1600 square feet. Um, it gives your uh, energy cost over here. And just for comparison for later on, the estimated annual energy cost for this home in Coeur d'Alene is $932 a year. So that's, that's, that's good. Um, and so remember that number later, because I want to compare it to something else. It shows down here at the bottom what the lighting and appliance loads are, um, dryer efficiency, um, areas of the attic. I mean, it has a, there's a lot of information here. And I'm trying to see if it uh, gives us the air changes. If it does, it's so small, I can't read it. Anyway, I apologize. It just, this is what I had to use as an example, but this particular home is a 43, which is a good number. Remember the lower the number, the the more efficient it is. Um, the, whoops. Resident. No. <laughs> Resident and the International Code Council are working together. I'm gonna skip that one. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so <clears throat> when I put this together originally, let's see if the, yeah, it's all here. When I put this together originally, the remember I said earlier that this came out as part of the 2015 code, and it had a very low score, um, climate zone five, they were asking for 55, and then climate zone six was 54. At the time, that was, that was pretty hard to do without um, using, you know, some type of renewables. And so, you know, we, showed this in Idaho and they said, well, there were two things that we were trying to do. One, because we had modified our codes, um, specifically the prescriptive tables, they wanted a comparable number. So even though this was a nationally published number, Idaho wanted to know what that number would be if it was compared to a, an amended prescriptive home. And so we tried to do that. And again, you know, numbers will tell whatever story you want them to tell. 
Um, and we had a hard time getting agreement on, on what number to use. Since we, at this time, we had not um, been able to move this through the legislature, we were floating another idea that said, well, what if we made it easier to meet the, the, the score um, to try to incentivize more raiders, right? If we can, we don't wanna make their job so difficult they can't do it or so costly that the builders don't wanna do it. And so we, we were looking at a tiered rate that, would, that was by house size where starter homes would be allowed to be a little less efficient um, because of just your cost per square footage. And so that's why this information is up there. And I think it's, it's still um, something worth looking at. Um, Sun Valley had a similar system in place there for their construction where it was based on a square footage size and depending on how big a house you, you were building, it had to have a certain uh, ERI score. This all went away, <laughs> um, but it was interesting to see the numbers because when, it, when we jumped to the 2018, um, climate zones five and six are at 61. And so how, why did it get less, right? And everybody's saying, you know, we always want to adopt the latest version of the code because it's always more efficient. Um, well, you know, the so we're not sure exactly what happened here. Before this was published in the 18 code, we were attempting to put uh, a number together again, trying to equal uh, the prescriptive requirements of the state. And so Idaho amended this to 68. Um, which was even less restrictive than this. And we reached out to the to the raiders and stuff, and we said, you know, here's the information. Um, can you give us a number, you know, that, that we can agree on? And again, we couldn't get anybody, we couldn't get a number to agree on. And so, you know, as the person writing this for the state, writing the amendments, I just said, well, can we live with 68? Because I can't. You know, I mean, that's what it comes out when I do the modeling. And so that's what was put in there. And unfortunately, nobody liked the number. Um, the Raiders wanted less. The builders didn't seem to care. Um, and so we finally, you know, now have it very clearly written in the code. And the consensus right now as we're going through the, the code revision process is use the code. And so that amendment that was put in there, most likely uh, we have, we've heard no arguments to support maintaining the amendment. And so we will probably be using this number uh, moving forward for a while. Jerry, a, a question for you. Sure. And maybe you'll get to this later and jump into the gun. And if so, feel free to just keep going. But this number where we're at 100, for 2006 road home versus a net zero home, is it based on utility cost, emissions, total energy, and like kilowatt hours or KV to use? Um, what what's being compared for that to? So the I'm not sure everybody heard that, but uh, Damon was asking, what does the number truly represent? And it is energy use, and so it would be KWBTU. Okay. Um, these are, are intended to be one percentage points. Okay. And so if, uh, if you're building a house to, that has a 61, it would use 61% of the energy that a 2006 energy code built home would, would be. Um, and again, there, I'll show you some of the other, in fact, we're gonna get into the variables right now about what, what drives this, this number. But it is, we like to call it the, a miles per gallon sticker for your house. You're buying two houses next door to each other, Both they could even be built by the same builder. This one's a 75, this one's a 60, and the price is the same, in, which one are you gonna take? You know, It sounds simple, it sounds easy, and, you would think the home buyers would be all over. They, it's deer in the headlights when you try to explain it to them. 
Um, and so if we go back to the certificate, that's why it's important that we show, you know, what all of the different things are, but it, it is something that um, you would have to educate the homeowner. You would have to help them understand um, what's really going on. And so I have a couple slides on, on how I would approach that if I was trying to, to sell it to somebody. Um, just for reference, um, both of my, I've only owned two homes in my life. I bought my first house in 1976, and I bought my second one in 2016. Um, both of them are HERS homes, and I will show you um, how the HERS played into the first one. The second one was designed with HERS in mind. It was built from the beginning. Um, I was able to get the files that they were using and, and walk through every step of that and say, I want to change this, I want to change this, um, and, and to get the house that we wanted. Um, and so... Um, it, it does allow itself, um, there is an opportunity for the homeowner and the builder to be engaged as you're designing the house, which is really the beauty of the software and the reason why I still use it. And so if somebody is asking me, um, I do, um, I call it, um, it's, a, it's a plan review, more of a an enhancement. I look at their plans and I look at what they're doing and say, oops, you should do this or this. And I can help them with the plan before it gets submitted just to make sure they're not doing something really bizarre, really dumb or really costly that's not going to give them return. And so I do some plan reviews for customers just to see if there's something there that can be improved without adding to the cost. And I wouldn't be able to do it without the software. So, so what do we look at? Um, a lot. There, if you were to print out, they have a field uh, form um, that accompanies the software. And if you were to print that out, it's over 50 pages of information that you would enter into there. And it's only one page per item. So in some items, you may have to add more pages. And so it's a, there's a lot of information that goes into it. There's a simplified method and an advanced method. And if we're just doing comparisons, we'll use the simplified. But if we're really digging into it and we're trying to, to look at everything, we'll use the more advanced. Um, so we look at, you know, these are just the big items. Um, you know, we look at the equipment, the appliance, ceilings, attics, crawl spaces, ductwork, um, the systems, the air leakage, walls, floors, leakage in the ductwork itself. All of these things are checked. Lighting, um, what's your ventilation system? Are you using ERV, HRV? Everything in there, you know, you just go after page after page. Um, and filling then these items. Once you have a kind of a base model, um, then it, uh, you know, you, the input becomes a little simpler. Um, but again, new houses can be extremely broken up with a lot of different rooms and elevations. And so it can get tricky um, trying to get all of that in there, but there's not much in there that is not accounted for. And then it also has um, inputs for, you know, alter, alternate um, energy. You know, if you're doing solar thermal or PV, you know, there's there's inputs for all that. And it has inputs for sunrooms and, you know, all the glazing and stuff. So why would the builders want to use this? Um, well, one of the things that they talked about, and this is an area of right now of, of where there's still some confusion, is, you know, federal tax credit. Can the builder apply for this tax credit and get it? Right now, that amount is $2,500 per house. But it doesn't say specifically um, that it is okay for um the energy rating index. And so we, in talking with uh, 
the people that are, are you know, working with the Energy Star program and the tax credit, we still don't have clear language on does ERI suffice? And this is, uh, so what they're saying is in, in order for you to comply or to apply for the tax credit, the home has to be done to Energy Star version 3.1 which on this map is the yellow. And so right now there's only one state and this, this is information from yesterday. Um, there's only one state that, that has met the, or that is using the version 3.1. Um, Idaho is on, um, it says it's in effect on January 1, 2023. And this one was earlier than that. So the, uh, what I'm trying to, to show in this is that, you know, this 3.1 is only available after January 1st, 2023 and before 2025. After that, it has to be version 3.2. So we have to make sure or encourage uh, whoever is driving the bus in Idaho to you know, make sure that we're, we're where we need to be. The, do you guys do work with Energy Star? Do you do anything with that? Um, a, a little bit. I'm still figuring out exactly how far we're involved with doing strictly Energy Star. I'm with Intermountain in, in, in Mountain Gas, the okay. energy efficiency program over there. So, 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 so we're working primarily with HERS rating. Okay. Glad you're here. Thanks. Um, who is who is running the efficiency there now? Kathy Wool. Yeah, I, so tell Kathy I said hi. I've been out with her for years. And yeah, that's I will. I see. Um, so a couple of things. One, we need to be up to date for our builders to be able to apply for this. The secondary part of it is that Energy Star is actually a separate certification program. It's different than ERI, and they get into different things. And I think they get into some air quality stuff. And which is kind of outside of what this is. And so I know there's a lot of discussion going on, but we don't want to imply or give our builders the impression that if they get a HER score on their house, that they automatically qualify for that. That would be a disservice to everybody. Uh, it just puts confusion out there. So um, I know that DOE is very aware of this, and I know the people here in Idaho are looking into it. But as of today, we don't have clarification on it. And if anybody does, if anybody um, has a better picture of what's going on, please get a hold of me and I will add it to this presentation um, and make it available to um, I will repost it to anybody who's taking this class and make sure that we have the latest information. But this is where we're at right now. So there's a getting a $2,500 tax credit for builders would be huge. Um, and that's something they most definitely would be interested in. We need to make sure we find a pathway to get them to get that to them because this would, you know, the average cost of doing a HERS rating can vary from, um, you know, I don't think anybody's doing it for less than three or four hundred dollars, but typically the the range I hear is five to eight hundred, um, depending on the complexity of the house. And so if they could get all of that paid back and some, that's a big incentive for builders to, to go to this level. The other thing is, is uh, you know, you have a different compliance option for meeting your energy code. Um, you will have energy savings through it and it can complement your existing um, efficiency program. So if you're already wanting or claiming to build a better house, Having the number out there, having the certificate is your way of saying, you know, yes, we're, we are there. Um, as far as the retrofit strategy, I personally would not consider doing a house without doing a HERS rating on it. I want to know. Um, I want to know how much money I spend and whether or not I'm going to get that out the other end. And I want the testing done. And so... Not using this on a remodel, I think, is a big mistake. Um, and <clears throat> being able to give the customer something and said, because of what I did, 
this is what you have now and the customer being able to sell that. I'll kind of show you what I did on my own house um, as the reasoning for that. The other thing is, again, by using the software, we can look at what people are doing um, and tell them, you know, this does make a difference. I looked at one house where the trade-off was putting R38 in the floor instead of R30. And it's like, why would you, why would you do that? Um, and when I modeled it, of course, it said, no, I mean, we're not giving you nothing for that. And so it's a, it's a quick, easy way to look at something and say, well, it might sound good, but it really doesn't work. Um, and there's some other things that, that play into this. I don't want to get too deep into the woods, but I want to mention a couple of specific things. One is roof color. You know, you would think in a hot climate, if everybody would just use white or light colored roofs, we could save some AC energy. Right? And we can, but we have more heating than days than we have cooling days and having that dark colored roof in the winter helps heat the house. And so a lot of the things that, that make common sense don't factor in when you model the house, it, it trades it off. And to make that point even clearer is I'm sure everybody has heard of um, attic barriers or reflective attic barriers that go inside the house. And it's, it's basically giant sheets of mylar or aluminum foil that reflect the, the, the energy off of the house in the summertime. And when you model it, it gives you two to six dollars a year improvement, but it costs thousands to put in. And I even called the designers at Remrate and I said, what's the deal, you know? And they said, oh, it's, it's just a trade-off. If you are modeling the, the summer months versus the winter months, you would see what it does. But in our climate, specifically in, in, in Boise, it's a trade-off. Um, you know, it helps with this, but it doesn't help with this. And so the modeling is, is a beautiful place to, to do those experiments. And when you're looking at large cost items, you punch them in there, you know, and when you're, somebody is trying to sell something, a product or a service to a builder, we have the ability to model it. We can say, yes, that works. Yes, it doesn't. Um, and we can also show them how much money is involved and, and give them a potential payback. And to me, giving somebody good, in, providing good information usually results in good decisions um, versus, you know, being just subjected to a salesperson. So, it, um, it, it does help and it also allows for innovation. Um, we can move uh, windows around, we can rotate orientations on the house. You know, we can, we can show the builders, you know, is there a penalty of putting this house on this lot facing this direction versus putting it here or on the other side of the street? This is stuff they don't have access to, they, they don't know. And, uh, you know, maybe the particular house that they built, it could affect their AC by up to 30%, just the orientation alone. Or in my house, I very specifically, once I decided the house that I wanted, the orientation was, was hypercritical because if I moved at 15 degrees off of that access, I lose its, it lost its ability to heat itself in the wintertime. And so by choosing the right house on the right lot, my house heats itself in, you know, in the wintertime, anytime the sun's shining. And so there's, there's a huge benefit to that, but it didn't, it didn't really cost anything. So these are the innovation that we're looking for. What new ideas can we bring to the builder? It says, hey, if you're serious about saving energy, consider this, um, and there's a way to do it. And we can rotate the house 360 degrees and you can watch the numbers move around as you do it. Um, or if you're stuck um, in a bad orientation, you can regulate the solar heat gain on the windows or the size of the windows. Um, or do we need a covered patio? Do we need to shade the windows? You know, And so all of these things can be done in the software. I just think it's, it's a huge deal for the 
the builders. It also, you know, at the same time, we want to impress on the Raiders that they need to up their, their game and their skills to be able to point all of this out and take the time to sit down and, and look at, um, you know, other ways to do it. When we're using this software, especially live with the builders, this is the easiest way in the world to sell efficiency. It's right there in front of them. I mean, we don't have to push it. They can just say, you know, this is what happens when you do this. You know, when you upgrade this, it does this. So it becomes a really easy way to, uh, you know, get them thinking about efficiency. So how do we market it to the consumers? Um, the best way is, is what we already talked about. It's just a miles per gallon sticker. It's a direct comparison, you know, do I want to buy, you know, especially in, in remodel houses, my 1976 house, um, I'll show you the slides. It started out at 157. Um, you know, if you're comparing that to new house, it tells you it's going to use 57% more than most new houses. And, but if I drop that down to 77, then it says it uses half of the energy that it used to use. Oh, which by the way, means half of what all of my neighbors are paying around me because all these houses were built at the same time. In fact, most houses in 1977 are going to have a score like that. If you're able to relate to the homeowner what this actually means, and you back it up with your utility bills, it makes the house easier to sell, quicker to sell. You know, nobody wants high utility rates, right? That's not something we typically talk about at, when we're selling our homes. When I decided to sell my old house and on the entryway, I put the certificate and my gas and my electric bill right there as they walked in the house. And it's like, please take one or take, you know, take some. And they would look at it and it's like, your electric is, my combined utilities were less than $80 a month. And it's like, really? You know? And then they want to know why, you know? And so, you know, you have the opportunity to say, well, I did this, I did this. You know? But the big thing is, is they can tell by the comfort of the home. And where, even if they don't understand it on the utilities, when they walk inside and everything is stable and comfortable, you know, then they can then they can see it. So they're better performing houses. Um, they're lower ownership. If you're only paying eighty dollars a month in utilities, that leaves you a little more room for you know a mortgage payment, something else you may want. Um, and it does increase the resale value. And this is one of the things that, again, we have a hard time putting a number on um, the. Research that HERS and ResNet did on their own indicated that HERS homes sold faster and for more money, um, comparably. And all I can add is my own experience. Um, my house was on the market for a week. I took the second offer on the second day. And the reason the guy bought the house was because it, of what I had done to it. You know, He walked in, he knew it was comfortable. He was looking for an energy efficient house. All the paperwork was there. Everything else met, met its expectations. They put an offer in. And so um, I did sell the house for above value. And this was before all of this craziness started. Um, so, you know, it, I think it does make a difference. I followed up with him three years after he bought the house and he's, they were still in love with it. And of course, all of the energy was exactly what I told them and nothing had changed. In fact, it went down because they didn't keep it as warm as we did. So the bills even went, went down even more. So um, this is that video that was trying to play earlier. So this is actually off of my, my house at the Hampton house. And I wanted to point out just a couple of things here. Um, so Energy Star in 2012, the 2012 Energy Star would have if I would have built the house to Energy Star standards, it would have had a score of 74. As the house was built, um, the score was 157. So this was pre-improvement, just as, as is what was left from 1977. 
If you look at the uh, the heating loads, which is a big one, um, it was 60,000 BTU to heat that 1,100 square foot house. Um, to make matters worse, the furnace was actually 108,000 BTU. <laughs> Is the size of a small refrigerator, and so it had been overheated for you know since new. Um, but this this is just you know what we're looking at there. This is post improvement. Um, again, we have the Energy Star over here, and then the the house as it was done was a seventy seven, and we did a couple of other things. I I think the the final score ended up at seventy four. Um, and there was still quite a few things to do. So this was without any Energy Star appliances, which would have, would have dropped it even further. So, but it gives you an idea of, you know, what's possible. The notes said that uh, the the score at seventy four was a fifty three percent improvement that met Energy Star two thousand twelve standards. Um, so remember, this was done in about that time frame. The total projected utility cost is 988, uh, which was a 43% improvement over, over the existing. And the cost for heating and cooling um, was $397, less than $400 a year, which was a 60% improvement. So, um, and the heating load dropped to 29,000 BTU, which was a 51% improvement. So measurable on a number of, you know, areas and then proved, you know, through, through watching the utility data and monitoring the house. And so, you know, it, what I'm trying to say is that it lined up, everything lined up. A lot of people will say, well, you know, how often does the software, how often does the projections lined up? In this situation, they were close. Um, in the best of circumstances, if you can get within 10% of your projections, you're doing really, really well. 30% um, is acceptable um, because we can't, we just can't track the variables of what people do. Um, but we can track the energy heating and cooling fairly closely. So um, so I, I went a different avenue, and these reports, this is actually what. Um, the REM design, REM rate software does is it, is it gives you these reports. And so I went back and I said, if I built my new house, um, this is my new house, by the way, um, using it for calculations. If I build it to the 2009 baseline, which is what it was required at the time, um, my total energy use would be about $1,400 a year, 1375 If I moved it up to the 2012, 2015, which there was no changes between those two code cycles prescriptively, it would have dropped it to 1297, yeah, 1297. Um, and again, moving it to the 2018, we're not really changing much, you know, very small changes. It would have brought it down to 1234. So What's interesting in these is I'm using R21 walls all the way through, um, but the code change from 12 to eight through 15 to R49. And so that change is, is reflected here, um, you know, and then this change, the other change was the high efficacy lighting from 75 to 90. You'll see that over here, we're, you're allowed seven air changes and they want three. And so by taking the house from seven, which is extremely leaky to three, which is fairly tight, it really didn't have that impact that we were looking for. If you look at the AC, it didn't change it. Um, and the heating, it changed it by $90, which you would think would be more than that. So I come over here and I said, well, you know, this is nice. This is what everybody wants. You know, we all want the 18, and this is what I get. But what if I did my own modeling and said, I want to look at everything and see if there's a better way to do it. And so using this software, using the ERI, I went with R38 ceilings, 22.8 windows, 
um, LEDs, high efficiency first, all Energy Star appliances, and 1.26 ACH. And look what it did. So this is 18, and this is as we built it, which is not 18. You know? And so it, it's not about specific elements. It's about an overall design and looking at everything specific to the house and saying, what is the most efficient, effective way to build this house? And this is what we come up with. And I want to thank my builder for allowing me to work with the Hers Raider and look over his shoulder and say, no, let's do this, and, you know, and do this. But this is a production built house. All of this stuff is standard. Everything in here is standard. This is what you get when you build a house with them. Um, this is the only thing is the air sealing. And he allowed me to do the air sealing in the house. So I spent four days doing that. Everything else um, is, is just part of their production built house. And so this is the importance of the ERI. This is why I would like to see people use it. And I would like to see them go beyond just punching the prescriptive values in there and actually help design the house. And I think this is really where the value is at. Um, I can say without a doubt, that I'm, my house is it's extremely comfortable. Um, and it's 30 to 50% less, you know, utilities than my neighbors, um, you know, which, you know, I can, I just ask them, you know, I don't go out there and compare bills because I don't want them yelling at the contractor, but uh, it's very doable. And so we, we, you know, if we're, if we're trying to push the energy efficiency, we really want to use the tools that are available to us. And then we can get some really good results. The cost of the software, REM design is $500 um, a year. You have to renew it every year. Um, they do have a 14 day uh, free trial period where you can go on and download the software and incomplete uh, or complete. And you can do, you know, you can play with it to see if that's something that's going to work for you. It's not super intuitive, but if you have a basic understanding of stuff, you can get through it pretty easy. Um, so there isn't a lot of training programs that go with it. But, uh, anybody that's doing any kind of calculations currently could adapt to, to this system. So questions? One you already answered, but it doesn't have to be applied to new construction. You can take any home and do a first rating on it, and it can be higher than 100. Yes. And if you are doing an old home and you're, you want to remodel it, you want to know what do I need to change? Does it matter? You know, um, it, it really, I, I, I can't express how helpful it is because. My 1973 house that I bought in 76, it had R11 in the walls. So there's nothing I could do with that, but I was still able to get it to, to work like magic. And that house, um, the air ceiling, I got it down to 1.78. So without tearing into the walls. So it's a, it was very hard to get it down to 1.7. Um, four hours, four and a half hours. Four and a half hours. From 7.8 to 1.78. Gotcha. I'm still learning a lot about you know the the the, the requirements around you know, the air ceiling and all the all the different measures. Mm -hmm. so, so so I wasn't sure if that was necessarily a huge uh, barrier to that. So I I cheated on that when I called the spray pump guys. Oh, gotcha. So, seems like a pretty surefire way to get that done. Um, the biggest leaks in the house were all in the perimeter under the floors. Gotcha. And so by sealing the perimeter of the house and converting it to a sealed mechanically ventilated crawl. Um, got most of it, and then because there was so little insulation in the top, I was able to move it off of the tops of the walls, and so they were able to spray the tops of the walls. And so, yeah, the whole thing was done in four and a half hours. And I didn't have to be there. In fact, I couldn't be there because of the off gas and insulation. Um, here's my contact information, and you can call or text me to this number or email me again, 
happy to answer any questions related to this, or if you have other um, energy related questions. Um, I do have a, a lot of different um, topics that I cover in my education. And so, you know, reach out to me or Damon and say, you know, I mean, one, please comment on, on this, whether it's helpful or not. But if you'd like to see some different topics covered, um, just let us know. I'm happy to try to, to, to either deliver that or get somebody else to, to help deliver that. So thank you, everybody, for the time this morning. And uh, 